Hello, and welcome back to the Anatomy Lab for a final lecture, or lab lecture, depending upon your outlook. And today, folks, we do not get to use our model human as much because there's things missing here. For today, we do the reproductive system. And what that means is we have to come to a different table altogether. So with that in mind, let's uh, get to it, go through and look at some parts and pieces and see if we can figure out kind of what they're for. All right, enjoy. All right, here I have your PDF on the reproductive system. And I'm gonna somewhat follow uh, this around a little bit. As with all things, there's a lot here. All right, there's a lot going on there. And I'm gonna cover a, a lot of it, but probably not all of it. And again, uh, as is the way of things with us, uh, if I don't talk about it, probably not anything you need to worry about for lab, okay? So I'm gonna run you through these models real quick and, and we're gonna see if we can't figure out the parts and pieces that are found there. Well, folks, not exactly sure where I wanted to start this. So we're just gonna grab one of these models and hope for the best. So away we go. I'm gonna start with the actual gonad being the testis. And then we're gonna run away from that all the way out of the body. And we're gonna do the same thing on the female side of things. Start with gonads and kind of go from there. So the nature of this is that you have the physical gonad itself, the testis here, which produces the sperm. And then everything else is just um, accessory, if you will, in order to get said sperm out of the body and to the eggs, which are over here. Everything else, you gotta think about this team, everything else involved here, Hang on, I'm getting a weird echo. <laughs> I'm gonna scoot over a little. I'm get, yeah, that's better. I'm getting, I was getting a weird residence. Anyway, the whole idea here <clears throat> is that none of this matters. None of this matters, except getting the egg for, or I'm sorry, the sperm from here to the egg over here, and then having the chance to grow that uh, egg to maturation. All right, that, that's, that's the simplest way I can explain this to you. So with that in mind, let's dive right into this dead gum thing and, and sort of see where it takes us. So let's open up the testis. These are nice little magnetized bits. It's kind of handy. Now what you see here are lobules of the testis inside of here. What's happening in reality is that these are seminiferous, seminiferous tubules. Seminiferous tubules are where the sperm are physically made. Spermatogenesis, as it were. Spermatogenesis will be happening in here. Uh, those sperm will break out as um, um, spermatozoa, and those will move up to what's called the retae testis, and then eventually move into the epididymis. And it's in the epididymis, which is the kind of back part here. It kind of cups the testis in the grand scheme. It's in the epididymis that the sperm will mature and become prepared to fertilize an egg. They're not really swimming around at this stage, but they are ready to begin the process. Uh, just a, a few chemicals during the ejaculatory process actually lead them to having the capacity to be modal. And that's gonna happen, well, I guess, right now. So uh, upon ejaculation, what's gonna happen is there's gonna be smooth muscle lining this tube, and that smooth muscle runs peristaltic motion and pushes the sperm up and up and up through the vas deferens or a ductus deferens, vas deferens, and they will pass through here where we have inside of this seminal vesicles here. All right, now you have a variety of uh, glandular tissues that assist you with the production of semen that's gonna be mixed in and sort of preparing the sperm to uh, be sent in to get at an egg. The nature of this is as follows. You have these seminal vesicles here, and if I crack this thing open, yeah, you can see the prostate gland there. And then at the base of the penis, you end up, and this is just the worst way to look at this. I'll, I'll try to throw an image up so this will make more sense. But you have what's called a bulbo-urethral gland. All right, so there's a bulbo-urethral gland. There is the prostate, and there, on the side of this thing, there are those um, seminal vesicles. Now, the seminal vesicles here, okay, seminal vesicles, and the prostate 
make like 90% plus of the um, semen, as it were, that's going to keep the sperm alive, keep them nourished, provide for an appropriate environment for them to be released for usage. Uh, and then the bulbo urethral gland, which again would be at the base of the penis, kind of on one side over there, and then they're trying their best to show it to you is that little dot right there. Um, the bulbo urethral glands, what's going to happen is during uh, sexual excitation, the bulbo urethral glands are going to, um, well, let's just leave it like this, are going to release a alkaline fluid that is going to be pushed out and through the urethra of the penis in order to neutralize any acidity that's there from any potential remaining urine that might be hanging out, okay? Uh, so one thing that sperm do not like is acidity. So in order to prevent um, said acidity from being an issue, you'll have those bulbourethral glands release fluid through the urethra during sexual excitation in order to clean out anything there that might be deleterious. So it's going to get the, the pH where it needs to be for use. Now, <clears throat> uh, what all have we done here? So we've got bulbourethral glands we've done. We have talked about uh, man, that keeps happening. The seminal vesicles up here. We have talked about the prostate, and I believe I talked about the prostate previously as uh, swelling up as a man will age and causing problems with urine flow. You can see this thing surrounds the urethra coming from the bladder here, uh, so that most certainly can be an issue when this swells. Uh, and if you look at the top of this, you can actually see, again, the vas deferens coming down. It will be connecting on the back, just like here. All right, fast deference coming down. And then this tube here is going to be the ureter coming down off of the kidney and then terminating into the bladder here at that trigon of the bladder. So the bladder is storing urine. That urine flows through the prostate and then out of the urethra. And this would make it a uh, common exit, if you will. So this is going to be used uh, for both copulation purposes and urination. Now, in the penis itself, uh, there's a few things to know. Uh, key amongst these are going to be the, um, let me call it, corpora cavernosa, corpora cavernosa, the corpora cavernosum, which would be kind of here. And the reality is there's kind of like one on each side of the penis, like one on the left side, one on the right side. And these have these big open chambers inside of there. Uh, that will fill with blood to cause an erection and then also around the urethra is what's called the corpus spongiosum okay corpus spongiosum which is still just erectile tissue all right uh, the penis being very similar uh, to the clitoris on the female side and all the glandular networks in here being very similar to the glandular networks in here. Uh, it, it, they're remarkably similar is what I'm trying to tell you folks. They are remarkably, remarkably similar. Um, you'll, you'll see more of this as we get to it, but if you just kind of look, you get an idea of what I mean when I say that these are quite similar. Their orientations, oh my gosh, just a little variance in hormone causes these to develop in the way that you see here. Let's see, what else do I have here? So you can actually make out the um, testicular artery in red kind of coming down through here, terminating on the testis, all right? And then coming up off the testis in the epididymis, which is kind of interesting, is this pampiniform plexus, all right? Uh, or pampiniform venous plexus, or really it's a testicular venous network, uh, but pampiniform plexus, all the same. Uh, coming up off of the testis and draining the epididymis as well. So that's going to be part of the blood supply of the testicle. So I've got my uh, tunica vaginalis on the outside of the testis and tunica alvaginia on the inside surrounding the lobules. Got our rete testis. Got the epididymis coming up the uh, spermatic cord. Uh, that's deferens, if you will. And that terminating here into a series of channels pairing up with the seminal vesicles uh, leading to ejaculation using fluid from the seminal vesicles and the prostate gland. Uh, once the urethra is cleared by the bulbo urethra glands, that semen with sperm will be ejacu or ejaculated from the penis at that stage having full corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum 
and the penis itself again with the glands on the end quite representative all of this of the same basic structures in female anatomy that folks is how uh, these parts work that's how they work and i think that's got it let's take a stab at the uh, female reproductive system as well uh, it's getting late in the day here uh, but you know perhaps perhaps that'll do and we'll be all right we'll see how this turns out uh, you can see that these two are different here we've got a uterus that's quite small and this here uterus is larger you can guess that with, as to why that is uh, but with that in mind let's go do uh, through and do the rest of this thing and then kind of just see where it takes us all right so with that in mind away we go uh, what i have here is a nice ovary and the ovary isn't really connected very well to the rest of the um, system it's actually an open channel here and the fimbriae i believe have um, uh, cilia that, that wave and pull eggs in from the ovaries into this infundibulum of the fallopian tube all right so you're going to take an egg from the ovary it's going to be pulled in via these fimbriae and then flow through the infundibulum of the fallopian tube and through the fallopian tube down and into the uterus and you can't see it obviously <laughs> <laughs> let's see if i can open this thing up at all yeah there we go all right so now you can see into where the fallopian tube would then come in and connect to the uterus to convey an egg down and into uh this structure all right now side view what i want you to notice first and foremost we have the nice uterus here this is going to be made out of musculature I refer to as the myometrium and then the inner lining of this which is shed on a roughly monthly cycle that would be the endometrium endometrium now we can follow this down follow this down to the cervix here and then through the vaginal opening here now the nature of this is the sperm would be deposited here at the cervix uh, those sperm would make their way up into the cervix uh, believe it or not the chemicals that are released uh, by the prostate etc over here uh, these same chemicals will stimulate the mucus of the cervix to relax a bit and become looser to facilitate sperm travel and there is theory out there that the chemicals found there will also elicit some minor degrees of uterine contractions uh, that might help to pull uh, semen containing sperm up into the uterus and facilitate fertilization in the event there's an egg present so make sure we're together ovary fimbriae fallopian tube with this infundibulum here coming down into the uterus here myometrium endometrium cervix and then down the vaginal canal all right uh let's see we got a bladder here you can see a nice ureter coming down through here uh there is a round ligament okay literally a round ligament which would help to suspend the uterus in place and kind of help to hold things this is referred to oftentimes as the fundus of the uterus yeah man i think that's getting close all right in terms of external anatomy on the female what you have is oh my gosh Let's see if i can get this daggum thing to come out of there all right what you have is pretty straightforward there are labia majora labia majora labia minora and then again the clitoris right here at the top very much analogous to the glands of the penis uh, the labia here very much analogous to the scrotal sac all right very similar structures that's what you got to think about here very similar structures out in the front here is a structure we call the mons pubis and uh yeah it's about the extent uh, something interesting that I could point out here is that uh, on the male side of things, you have those bulbo-urethral glands at the base of the penis, as I described previously, uh, that produce a fluid that sort of runs through the urethra of the penis and cleanses it and gets any urine out of there, fixes the pH of the urethra for the passage of sperm. Uh, very similar to this. Okay, very similar to this on the female side of things uh, again imagine we have this piece here and that would come off 
If you look, you've got the opening for the urethra here. You have the opening for the vagina here. And right next to it is a tiny little spot. Can you see that? A little bitty spot. That's the opening of what's called a, a Bartholin's gland. All right, a Bartholin's gland. And the idea is that this produces, in essence, a lubricant for the external surface of the vaginal opening. Very similar to bulbo urethral glands. Very similar concept. Again, if you get nothing else out of this, you need to realize we are not that different, okay? We have all the same basic parts. They're just in slightly different orientations and serving minor variants on the same purpose. Um, and that would be part and parcel with these Bartholin's glands and the um, bulbo-urethral glands. So there's all sorts of variations here of very similar items. All right, next part, we have a pregnancy here, folks. If I crack this thing open, if this falls out, I apologize. I, I realize it's just glued in place. Uh, but I want to show you a few things on this because I find it pretty dead and fascinating. So what we have here is obviously a kiddo hanging out, connected via a um, umbilical cord to mom via the placenta. So the placenta is going to be right there, this red sort of semicircular area that red area that right there that's the placenta and the placenta doesn't have direct blood flow between mom and baby what it does is it brings mom's blood into very close proximity to the baby's blood and allows it to not intermingle but have diffusion okay it's bringing in oxygen getting out wastes that sort of thing. So they're not intermingling with one another. They're just coming into very close proximity to one another. Uh, in and amongst this, this is going to be the amniotic cavity. You could call this little white line here the amnion. And uh, yeah, yeah. So this would be getting progressively larger. And um, at the base of this, at the cervix, there would form a thick, thick mucus plug uh, that would help to block off the vagina and any potential pathogens that might possibly make their way up and in uh, from get, being able to get in here and cause any issues with this kiddo. In fact, during the late stages of pregnancy, one of the things that uh, sort of tells us that we're about to have a baby is when this mucosal plug is shed and flows out of the vaginal opening. Uh, so yeah, this is an early embryo. I'm not going to put a number on it. I'll, I'll do some looking and estimate that size. There's about an inch and a half in length uh, and put it on the screen here as to how old I believe this should be. Well, look what we have here. Uh, here is a much later, near full term, you know, eight, nine month uh, kiddo here. That's roughly the approximate size for the birthing process. Whoo! Yeah, no fun. No fun to be had. <laughs> so I've, I've got three kids, so I can I can say that to some degree. Uh, what we have here is the uterus. Look at the size. Let's come out. Let's not take it out. That seems like it's a problem. Is look at the size of that uterus. It's massive. Okay. This is one of the unique things about smooth muscle is it's capable of being mitotic and dividing and that uterus is going to be massive in size and weight by comparison to what it is in a person whom does not have a child okay very very different nice placenta there you can see the line of the placenta and folks let me tell you something that is wholly underselling the placenta uh, when the placenta comes out you could hold it up and it's like you know See if I can see my hands. It's like, it's massive. It's a huge sheet of material. The placenta is really big indeed. Uh, so we got our, our kiddo here, our fetus. We got our placenta. You can see inside of this amniotic sac here. And then down here, you see this sad little crushed bladder, which is why mom's got to go to the bathroom every five minutes. It's a real problem when there's no room inside of here. It's a real problem, all right? Um, so treat a pregnant lady nice and take good care because they're going through a lot in this particular type of situation. So bladder there crushed down. Uh, the head of the kiddo is down and um, on lay laying in this fashion. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. All right, so what you don't want is a kid flip the other way. You do have back labor and that's bad news.
All right, yeah, so you can see the cervix here. I believe they're trying to show you the mucus plug, if I had to guess, and then the vaginal opening down through here. And uh, that's how this works, man. Yeah, so that that's how this works. Very simple process in reality. Hi everybody, I have realized that I neglected to record anything on histology for this lab, and that's a mistake. Um, histology is incredibly important on all aspects of anatomy and physiology, and you knowing how to use a microscope and knowing what to look for, that these, these things matter, and it's a real shame from my perspective that we're not in face-to-face -face classes just because you're missing out on all the microscopy work that you should be doing. Uh, but with that in mind, I just wanted to run you through a few histological concepts just so you'd know what you're looking for when it comes to the reproductive system. So let's knock that out real quick and see where it takes us. Now, first things first, this is in a testis. And inside of this, we have these seminiferous tubules. Uh, in and amongst these, so when you look at a testis and you're looking at the seminiferous tubules in the lobules, you get an image that looks something like this, okay? So these are all piles of seminiferous tubules. They would all be looped around and connecting to one another and all kind of madness. But with this, as it sits, they're cut, so all you see is the circles. And what you should notice, and I put a little diagram down here to help you see it, is there will be uh, spermatogonial cells around the outside, kind of like this. Spermatogonial cells are going to be making sperm, and as they move in, they're going to turn into um, smaller variants of these big old cells, and you'll actually see the tails beginning to grow. So those are sperm tails. I don't know if you can make out that that's what that is, but there's a spiral through there. You see these uh, tubules, if you look, they got this dark line around them. That's actually smooth muscle, and it, it will flex peristaltically to propel these growing sperm down this tube. In essence, they begin to grow as spermatogonial cells, and then there's primary and secondary spermatocytes, and eventually you're going to have uh, um, individual spermatids, or, or uh, zoosperm or what have you, spermatids will do for me, the uh, near functional sperm, if you will, are going to have their tails. You'll see them in the center of these seminiferous tubules, and then they'll break loose and they'll flow down the tubule, making their way uh, to the reda testis and then into the epididymis. All right. Now, in and amongst this, not only do we have these uh, initial spermatogonial cells and then the spermatids as they grow inwards and develop their tails, which aren't as visible in this image. Uh, but this image has really nice spermatogonia, so, and you can see the muscle, so I wanted to provide it. Uh, but also built in and amongst this are what are called Sertoli cells. Now, Sertoli cells are basically derivative of um, the epithelium that makes this whole thing up. So there will certainly be epithelia in and amongst this. And when you look for the Sertoli cells, you're really looking for a cell with like its own little inside nucleus bits, something like this, all right? So you can almost see, it's almost like a cell with the nucleus and its nucleolus. These are classic Sertoli cells kind of pushed off and in here. You can see the difference between this big old thing and that little thing there. Um, so that, that's sort of what's happening here. And further, um, I want to point out the Leydig cells. So these are what are called interstitial or Leydig cells. So the Sertoli cells are basically helpers. They, they sort of help to um, allow development of the developing spermatids. And the Leydig cells, what they do is they make testosterone. So if I were you, I would have a grasp on sort of what these are and what they do. Uh, be able to label that seminiferous tubule, be able to label these uh, primary spermatocytes or spermatogonial cells, spermatogonial cells, then some spermatocytes in here, and then you have individual spermatids kind of breaking loose. Uh, for those, what you're really looking for are the dark nuclei. There's not a lot in this particular image, um, but again, this, this shows us that ring of smooth muscle, which I think is kind of fascinating, and you can see the Sertoli cells in there. But generally speaking, what I want is the spermatogonia, and then understanding that there are spermatocytes inside of here. All right, good. Uh, next part of this is the ovarian cycle. So the main thing I want to focus on here is the ovary itself. So when you look at an ovary, uh, when, when a lady is born, she has all the eggs she'll ever have. And they're in the form of what are referred to as these primordial follicles. So these primordial follicles, if you look, they just line the edges of the ovary. So that's like an, here is an ovary. And lining the edges, you would find these primordial follicles. Now, uh, what will happen is, via the processing of the menstrual cycle, these some of these will begin to develop over time. 
and these can be from all sorts of different animals so I don't want to uh, use them and say they're, they're human models but the point will stand all right so when they begin to develop they'll first develop as primary follicles so basically what you'll find is a nucleus with a or really it's a um, what do you call it primary oocyte if you have an oocyte in there it'll be an egg cell and it'll be surrounded by some cells that you can make out it's not like it's just a little oocyte by its lonesome it's a cell with stuff around it okay so that's a primordial i'm sorry a primary follicle the secondary follicles we look for the development of an antrum so the antrum is the open area here so that it would be a secondary follicle and then we go over here to what's called a graphian follicle when you look for a graphian follicle you want to see this big like it's like a the oocyte is sticking off on its own little stem like this this is a classic graphian follicle so if that's uh primordial follicles all in here um primary secondary nice big graphian follicle and then what will happen is uh that egg is going to be ejected from the uh ovary and after the egg is ejected, that uh, follicle will break down into a corpus luteum. And the corpus luteum in real life looks something like this. And what that corpus luteum is going to do is it's going to start cranking out um, progesterone like it's going out of style. And in essence, make the uterus ready and prepared for implantation of an egg. So if the egg's fertilized, the corpus luteum stays put and it keeps on cranking out progesterone like it's going out of style. And it basically will do this until the uh, placenta has developed enough to take over, and then the corpus luteum degenerates. But if there is no fertilization, if there is no egg uh, to implant into the endometrium of the uterus, that corpus luteum will degenerate into what's called a corpus albicans. Albicans means a white scar. It's basically like a little piece of scar tissue inside of the ovary. So that corpus albicans... Uh, is the the final result of the ovarian cycle and folks that's that's kind of what I got to say to you today um, I'm kind of happy with it I, that's good enough for histology that's gonna have everything I want make sure you can label these oocytes make sure you can tell me what a corpus luteum is tell me about that corpus albicans tell me about these primordial follicles and the oocytes they're in understand that they are haploid cells not diploid cells but if we were to get one of these oocytes together with one of these sperm we could make a diploid cell that would be a zygote all right just get the point understand that testosterone is released by Leydig cells you know little things like this uh, and that will be good enough for me all right folks uh, you have a great day and good luck on your exam